Keep the Faith Ministry. Keep the Faith brings you timely messages with in-depth spiritual analysis of current events in light of Bible prophecy so you can prepare for the coming of Jesus. Listen to what the news won't tell you. Here is another important message for our times. This is Pastor Hal Mayer. Dear friends, thank you for joining us today for another timely message from your friends at Keep the Faith Ministry. I'm Pastor Hal Mayer, and I have an incredible message for you today. As I think back over the last year of the rapid-fire disasters that have accumulated in the world, I am astonished. The world has gone wild. A staggering number of people were killed by sudden disasters, ranging from earthquakes, floods, volcanoes, fires, to other major catastrophes. The earth reeled to and fro from it all. One authority suggested that the earth struck back in 2010. But there are subtle changes taking place on the planet, too, that expose human populations to the violence or the caprice of nature. For instance, we are dramatically losing core essentials that are responsible for making sure that food will grow. It seems that every area of nature is being affected. The world is under siege. Nature is being turned out of its course. I don't think most people realize how vulnerable we really are and how dependent we are on the God of nature to protect his children. There is something happening to the ecosystems of the planet that will eventually threaten human survival. I don't know about you, but as I research for this message, I am dumbfounded by the magnitude of the eco-collapse as well as the frightening display of the power of nature that we have seen in recent times. But before we begin, I want to thank you for your prayers and your gifts to keep the faith ministry. We are truly a faith ministry and we depend on your partnership to help us get the word out. All our subscriptions are free, but they cost money and it is our privilege to have your support as we partner together to send out our little CD preachers to so many people. We currently ship about 15,000 CDs each month, and the numbers continue to grow. So your gifts are very important to us. You and your family mean so much to the survival of Keep the Faith ministry, and during this time of economic difficulty, it is especially meaningful to us to have your support. We cannot continue the work without you. Thank you so much. Please go to our website and view our prophetic intelligence briefings, articles, sermons, and other material online. There is so much material that we can't put on our CDs, but we are able to include it on our website. Also, please tell others about Keep the Faith. Give them a CD and ask them to sign up. Also, if you see an upcoming event on our webpage that is not in your area, but in the region of other family members or friends, Tell them about the meeting so they can attend. Now let us bow our heads in prayer as we seek the Holy Spirit to enlighten us today as we study. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your holy word that tells us what to expect as we near the end of time. We are on the brink of serious times, and it is our prayer that we will be faithful and not turn back from your grace and power. We need your power to overcome our sins. But we also need your instruction to explain how to live righteously in this present wicked world. Please send your Holy Spirit to us today as we open your word and compare it with the world in which we live. Most of all, show us how to get ready for the coming of Jesus. In his holy name I pray. Amen. I would like to begin with a verse from Proverbs chapter 1. And that's verse 20 through 23. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called, and ye have refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. 
but ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. Don't you just love that last part? Do you think that these verses represent the people of the world today? I do. Notice that wicked men will be filled with their own devices. It's amazing to me how the digital age has men filled with their own devices. Everything from iPhones and iPods and iPads, flat screen, high definition TVs, GPSs, and every other device under the sun. There are devices for the kitchen, the bathroom, the bedroom, the living room, and every other room of the house. There are wireless routers, surveillance cameras, barcodes, infrareds, and lasers. We are fascinated by devices. But we have other devices, too, you know. There are devices such as the way in which we manage our lives, or the way in which we manipulate things or others. But I'm also amazed how that the prosperity of the wicked actually destroys them spiritually. The Bible calls them fools. Anyone who turns away from God's truth will suffer affliction, and ultimately they will lose their eternal life. I'm also very interested in the effect of pesticides and genetically modified foods. Monsanto and other mega corporations are going to have a lot to answer for. Their greed and selfishness are only making their destiny certain. They may well be playing a part in the gradual destruction of the planet. God is wisdom. So it is God speaking in these verses from Proverbs we have just read. Wisdom therefore comes from God. So it is God's voice that is reproving the people of this world and calling upon them to repent. But the voice of God, the voice of wisdom, is unheeded. It is scorned, it is ignored, it is despised. Even among God's people, it is not respected. What a tragedy. And this can only yield disaster, eternal disaster. But it also brings disaster here on planet Earth. The world is under siege. Key destructive elements are consolidating to put the planet under great pressure. Notice that I said they are consolidating. What I mean by this is that destructive elements don't seem to be so isolated and disconnected anymore. They are working together. They are coordinated. They potentiate each other by compounding the effect when they are combined. It is as if there is no more room to maneuver. The world is fraying at the seams, and it is deadly. Are you aware that in the last year, the largest number of people ever have died by sudden disaster? Accounts that I have read put the number at nearly 300,000 people worldwide. But I suspect that it should be far more who have died in swift and potent catastrophes in 2010 alone. That is far more than the average of 77,000 deaths per year. The earthquake in Haiti alone killed more than 222,000 people, while heat waves and fires in Russia killed more than 56,000. The earthquake in Chile killed almost 1,000, and the floods in Pakistan and China killed more than 3,200. There were 950 major disasters recorded last year, more than any other year since 1980. There were almost three major disasters every day somewhere in the world. Something is happening, my friends, and the people of the world have no idea what is the cause. Craig Fugate, 
director of FEMA, which is the U.S. Federal Emergency Management Agency, said it just seemed like it was back-to-back, and it came in waves. The 100-year event really lost its meaning this year. FEMA handled 79 disasters in 2010, which was a record. The average is 34. It seems that in some ways the whole earth is coming apart at the seams. It reminds me of the statement in the book Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 391. Troublous times are before us. The judgments of God are abroad in the land. Calamities follow one another in rapid succession. Soon God is to rise out of his place to shake terribly the earth and to punish the inhabitants for her iniquity. Then he will stand up in behalf of his people and will give them his protecting care. He will throw his everlasting arms around them to shield them from all harm. What does it mean that the judgments of God are abroad in the land? It means that God is permitting the development of disasters in many different ways and in many different forms. You see, my friends, God's prophets accurately point out that at the end of time, everything will be in chaos. So as the earth shakes, rattles, and rolls, we are told that the worst is yet to come. Here is another statement that shows us that God permits Satan to wreak havoc on planet earth. This one is from Great Controversy, page 589 and 590. While appearing to the children of men as the great physician who can heal all their maladies, he will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Even now he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes. In every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest, and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint, and thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both man and beast, The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The haughty people do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. That's Isaiah 24, verses 4 and 5. Why do these things happen? It is because sinful man has turned away from God's commandments. Also, I want you to notice that violent storms or tempests which bring hailstones, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, cyclones are all mentioned in this passage. You can expect that Satan will soon let loose and more of these things will take place in rapid succession. But other types of weather systems can create havoc and be just as deadly. One huge weather system caused oppressive heat in Russia, while farther south it caused flooding in Pakistan that inundated 62,000 square miles, which is about the size of Wisconsin in the United States. That single heat and storm system killed almost 17,000 people. Instead of being a -a once-in-a-century event, Commentators are suggesting that this is a a once-in-a-100,000-years event. Scientists, naturalists, and other researchers also think that these disasters are essentially man-made. Man has certainly contributed to some of these deadly weather patterns and other catastrophes, but that deflects our attention from the real issues. The fact is, these self-appointed spokesmen for nature don't understand God nor do they believe God's holy word. They just think in terms of the natural world. They don't think about the supernatural. Roger Bilham, a professor of geological sciences at the University of Colorado, said, It's our fault for not anticipating these things. You know, this is the earth doing its thing. But that's not accurate. It's the angels of heaven that prevent the destruction of the whole planet. Not only would man destroy himself if left to his own devices, but Satan would be all too glad to oblige if God would permit. And one day he will. 
But it is the throne room of the universe that determines what is permitted and what is not. The earth is doing its thing all right, though still regulated by heavenly powers. I'm amazed that the earth has survived as long as it has. But the fullness of destruction has not yet been unleashed. But we are under siege. You see, my friends, most people just don't want to believe that catastrophes and disasters are permitted by heaven and that they are the voice of God speaking to them. They ignore the Bible, but they cannot ignore nature. Though they might try to ignore nature's God, they are aware that major events will increase and become more powerful. They don't want to think that God might be trying to tell them something. They don't want to think that God is in control of it all and is gradually withdrawing His Holy Spirit and that this is the reason we have so many problems. They just say that the earth is doing its thing. But friends, I don't believe that, do you? We are living in perilous times. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1-5. through They shall have a form of godliness but deny the power of God. But it is more than that. Most scientists want to reckon with nature without nature's God. They want to think about these natural things as merely natural, when God tells us that these things involve the supernatural. One Russian woman during Moscow's recent heat wave, smog, and wildfires said, I think it is the end of the world. Our planet warns us against what will happen if we don't care about nature. While there is an environmental impact because of man's selfishness, most people don't realize that it is because of sin that God allows disasters to plague the planet. Russia was one of 18 nations that charted record-breaking heat waves. But for many reasons, when nature strikes, the impact is disproportionate in these last days. Because of globalization, the effect is much more drastic and compounded especially because of the huge concentrations of populations in super cities that are so interdependent. Colorado's Billums said the world's population is moving into riskier megacities on fault zones and flood-prone areas. He figures that 400 to 500 million people in the world live in large cities prone to major earthquakes. And that is not counting the floods and other types of disasters that can strike these cities or their supply chains. Nations, cities, and societies have placed themselves where nature can attack them with lethal force. Huge cities along sea coasts and near fault lines, for instance, make millions of untold millions of people vulnerable to great seismic upheavals, tsunamis, and other assaults from the sea. But inland cities are often not much less vulnerable to droughts, heat waves, and fires either. Just ask the people in Moscow. Let us think about earthquakes for a few minutes. On the afternoon of January 12, 2010, the residents of the island nation of Haiti were going about their business as usual when a violent earthquake lashed out and threw the island into upheaval, killing approximately 225,000 people and leaving 1 million homeless, 250,000 residences and 30,000 commercial buildings were all destroyed. One year later, more than a million people are still homeless, living in tents and other makeshift structures. Then in October 2010, the misery worsened as a cholera outbreak began sickening over 100,000 people and killing more than 3,300 earthquake survivors. As I was preparing this message, the cholera outbreak had spread to all the provinces of Haiti, to the Dominican Republic, and even to the United States with no signs of letting up. Within a few weeks, another major earthquake did substantial damage to central Chile and killed approximately 800 more people. Several tsunamis attacked coastal towns and a remote island, killing more. In 2010, earthquake activity was more than all the years prior to it, except in 2007, particularly for magnitude 5.0 and higher quakes. But get this. 
There were more earthquakes above 7.0 magnitude in 2010 than in any previous year, at least as far back as 1970, but probably in all of recorded history. It is also important to note that up until 1999, earthquakes above magnitude 5.0 were well under 500 per year. Then in 2000, the number of large quakes started to climb rapidly. For the first time, there were more than 500 earthquakes with a magnitude of 5.0 or higher. Then in 2002, it was over 1,000. Then by 2007, it was around 2,200 earthquakes with a magnitude of 5.0 or higher. And while the total number of earthquakes each year will vary, it is important for students of prophecy to know that in the last nine years especially, there has been a substantial run-up of major earthquakes by a staggering factor of at least 600%. No honest scientist, when faced with the statistics, can rightly say that there has not been an increase in seismic activity and strength. But they do say it. They try to downplay the idea that earthquakes have increased. Also, the normal number of earthquakes greater than the magnitude of 7.0 is supposedly 16. But in 2010, there were 22, a whopping increase of 72%. If you would like to see a visual chart that tracks the major earthquakes since 1984, go to our website, click on this sermon, and scroll down, and you will see the chart posted there. A friend of mine did the research and put this chart together from various geological sources. At least one scientist is willing to acknowledge the increase in earthquake activity. Stephen S. Gao, a physicist at Missouri University of Science and Technology, said relative to the 20-year period from the mid-70s to the mid-90s, the Earth has been more active over the last 15 or so years. In other words, earthquake activity since 1995 has been more than between 1975 and 1995, though it has actually been less than a decade when the changes in activity started. It is admirable that he admitted the increase. He did not, however, suggest that any supernatural factors were involved. Many scientists like to argue that earthquakes are not increasing or getting stronger on average and the statistics are sometimes difficult to discern, perhaps because there's a vested interest among the scientific community to keep the precise details obscure. Yet to anyone that's paying attention, it is obvious that there has been a great increase in seismic activity. The Pacific Ring of Fire, as it is called, stretches all the way from New Zealand to Japan, then to Alaska and down to San Francisco and Los Angeles, and on south to Chile. It is very active at the moment with both earthquakes and volcanoes. Christchurch, New Zealand took a big hit when a 7.0 magnitude earthquake struck there in September. But big quakes of 7.0 magnitude or higher struck Indonesia four times, Vanuatu and Japan twice each, the Philippines, the Solomon Islands, India, Mexico, and Ecuador, as well as New Zealand. But there are countless thousands of smaller earthquakes that don't make much obvious impact. But something is happening. It seems as though the acceleration of the number and magnitude of earthquakes lays a foundation for further instability in the near future. Do you remember the statement we read in which God's messenger to the remnant, commenting on Bible prophecies concerning disasters, said, These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous? I would rather take what God says as the fact than what a so-called scientist says. It is happening, just as Jesus said it would. Scientists may try to explain the physical phenomena. They may try to tell you the natural reasons why these things happen, but they don't understand prophecy, and they will naturally try to rule out the influence of an almighty power that rules the depths of the earth and the fountains of the deep. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis 7, verse 11, if you can. I want to show you something about the natural world. The Bible says about Noah, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, 
the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the foundations of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Please notice that the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. What are the fountains of the great deep, and how did they get there? A fountain is water under pressure. The fountains of the great deep are waters below the earth and in the seas, and they are under pressure. Do you think a tsunami is water under pressure? It sure is. And so, when there is a tsunami, you can say that the fountains of the deep have opened up. Listen to this verse from Proverbs 8, verse 27 to 30. Speaking of the time when God created the earth, the Bible says, When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Who is it that controls the fountains of the great deep and windows of heaven? Only God controls them. Satan can only manipulate them if God gives him permission. But the awesome powers of nature are all under God's control. Now let us look at Genesis 8, verse 2. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. That was at the end of the flood. Do you think that the elements of nature restrain themselves? Do you think that man can control these things? And do you think that man actually understands the depths of these natural phenomena? Man may be able to develop tools under Satan's power to manipulate them. He may be able to defend himself against some of nature's power, but ultimately we are all very vulnerable to these forces. Science can research and understand to some extent the reasons for the natural disasters we face in the world, but they can never acknowledge what God tells us in His Word. He is the one who controls and restrains the forces of nature or releases them. So whom do you want to believe? The scientists or the Bible? Did you see the powerful Icelandic volcano last April? Did you notice how the spewing magma and ash grounded the whole airline system over Europe, which spread its effects to almost every corner of the globe? A hundred thousand flights were canceled over six days. And if the volcano would have erupted for a longer period of time, there would have been substantial difficulties in getting food and other basic necessities into the shops and warehouses of Europe. If it would have gone on long enough, it would have been more than stranded passengers who would have panicked. European society would have been greatly stressed or even unraveled. Imagine a whole sophisticated society like Europe in a state of panic because they cannot get their basic needs met. And Europe got another big hit to its entire transportation system as powerful blizzards created chaos on its air, rail, and highway traffic throughout the last two weeks of December. Imagine if the snowstorms were much worse or extended over a longer period of time. Again, this kind of scenario could eventually stress society very greatly. Something is happening, and it is worldwide. Have you noticed that natural events of all sorts are coming at a rapid-fire pace? The world is under siege. Why? For what reason? And then there were floods. Major floods were recorded in Poland, Portugal, and Pakistan, Brazil, France, Romania several places in Canada and the USA, China, Hungary, Peru, Mexico, Spain, Colombia, Indonesia, Serbia, Argentina, Kenya, Nigeria, Guatemala, Singapore, and several places in Australia. In fact, the relentless floods in Queensland, Australia, covered an area larger than Texas, America's second largest state, which is 268,000 square miles, or 740,000 square kilometers. That's a lot of land. 
Several people were killed and more than 200,000 were stranded without access to supplies during this unprecedented catastrophe, with over a billion dollars in damage. Also down in Victoria, the opposite end of Australia from Queensland, one region had more than three meters of rain, or nearly 10 feet, in 2010. That's a lot of water, even for a whole year. In addition, some parts of Australia were plagued with a huge swarm of locusts, hailstorms, record heat waves, and other severe weather. Other weather records were set in 2010. Extreme heat was recorded in Los Angeles, California in September of 113 degrees Fahrenheit, or 45 degrees Celsius, while Pakistan took a hit of 129 degrees Fahrenheit, or 54 degrees Celsius, and may be the hottest temperature on record in an inhabited area of the globe. Drought struck too. China, Russia, and the Ukraine had several droughts. So did the Amazon. Parts of the Amazon River Basin were at their lowest water levels in recorded history. Something is happening. Why the wild weather? What is the reason for these extreme changes? Have you ever heard of a two-pound hailstone? That's almost one kilogram. One fell in North Dakota during a storm that did enough damage to class that area as one of the seven disaster areas of that state for 2010. Have you ever heard of a tornado strike in New York City? It happened on September 16, killing one person and walloping Brooklyn and Queens with a brutal storm. In one day, Indonesia got hit with a trio of deadly catastrophes, an earthquake of 7.7 .7 magnitude, a deadly tsunami, a volcano, 500 dead and 390,000 homeless. But that was after flooding, landslides, and more quakes which had killed hundreds earlier in the year. Many scientists, news writers, and other media outlets are quick to claim that all this severe weather and other disasters are because of global warming, and they blame humans for causing much of it. While there could well be some connection there, I'm not at all convinced that climate change is the sole answer. But keep in mind that Satan can also manipulate the climate, and God can give him permission to do it. When it gets serious enough, man will certainly see God's hand and huge numbers will acknowledge divine punishment. But they will advocate the wrong solution to get the world back into favor with God. They will push for Sunday laws that are in direct opposition to the law of God. And this will make matters even worse, as the rebellion to the truth is solidified and consolidated, and then focused on the few that honor the Lord's Sabbath. In more recent times, there is another, more mysterious problem. About 5,000 birds, mostly red-winged blackbirds and starlings, died within a one-mile radius of B.B. Arkansas near Hot Springs. They simply dropped out of the sky in mid-flight. There was no sign of any chronic or infectious disease, the official report of the Game and Fish Commission said. The birds showed evidence of trauma in the breast tissue, with blood clots in the body cavity and a lot of internal bleeding. All major organs were normal. Some ornithologists said that mass die-offs are normal. Wait a minute. Is dropping dead in mid-flight normal? How does a mass of 5,000 birds hit something in flight that causes all of them to drop out of the sky? That's virtually impossible. Are they really serious? Do these researchers think that we are gullible? And while there are occasions when extreme weather or hitting something in flight or other types of trauma can kill birds, the sheer number of these dead birds makes normal sound very unconvincing, to say the least. But mass bird die-offs have been happening around the world. 8,000 turtle doves dropped out of the sky in Fenza, Italy, shortly after the blackbirds in Arkansas. They died showing signs of hypoxia, or a lack of oxygen. That causes birds to be confused, as it does humans. Other suggestions are that the birds were swept up in a high-altitude windstorm before falling to the earth. 
Again, I'm skeptical. Why would 8,000 turtle doves get caught up in a normal windstorm and normally die of hypoxia? That doesn't sound normal at all. It sounds supranormal. It is as if they were herded together, placed in position, and then a strong wind came along and swept them up and killed them all. Perhaps it would not be significant if there were four or five turtle doves that died in this manner, or even ten or twenty. But eight thousand dying in mid-flight? No way. This is really strange. If the scientists and the media were successful in getting us to accept that this is just normal and natural, we would all sit back and think, okay, that was normal. Relax. Nothing will happen that's any more serious. If this kind of thing was normal, do you think we would then look to see if God is trying to tell us something? The more people get into the habit of taking the media and the scientists at face value, the less likely they are to perceive what is really happening. Don't forget that most of the media and the scientists want to keep you and everyone else from hearing God's voice in these disasters. They want to downplay them so that you will not perceive that the end of the world is near and that Jesus is coming soon. But my friends, don't you think it's a little strange that all these bird deaths are happening at around the same time? That's another mystery that the scientists are having a hard time figuring out. Think about it. In addition to the birds in Arkansas and Italy, 500 red-winged blackbirds, starlings, and grackles were found dead in southern Louisiana. And several hundred birds were found dead in western Kentucky. And scores of dead coots were found in Texas on a bridge. The birds showed no signs of disease or poison. Between 50 and 100 jackdaws, a type of crow, have died in central Sweden, perhaps from winter stress, they say. But they were reported only days after the birds in Arkansas and Louisiana died. And there are penguins dying in the Antarctic. They can't get enough fish to feed themselves and their chicks, so they are starving. The reason for the lack of fish is, is supposedly the warm La Nina weather patterns that have decreased the fish population dramatically. Petrels, sooty shearwaters, and gannets are also dying in large numbers. So why would there be massive die-off of fish, particularly the fish that feed these birds in the South Pacific and the Antarctic area? Is it possible that God is permitting strange weather patterns in order to allow nature to stress the planet as a warning to the wicked people of this world? Do you think God is allowing this so that God's people will wake up to the nearness of the coming destruction of civilization and the second coming of Jesus? What's going on? The world is under siege, particularly from the weather, which has affected nature in profound ways. And as the birds died in central Arkansas, at least 100,000 fish turned up dead in northwest Arkansas along a 30-mile stretch of the Arkansas River. While mass fish die-offs do occur, the magnitude of this one is very unusual. And in Maryland, USA, two million dead fish were washed ashore along the Chesapeake River. They usually swim to warmer water to survive the winter, but for some reason they didn't do it in 2010. Again, officials say it's normal, or at least natural, but I don't think so. Unusually cold weather in Florida is blamed for killing off thousands of river fish along a river known as Spruce Creek and also in Cocoa in numbers too large to count. The cold weather also killed manatees, starfish, and jellyfish. Do you really think it was the cold weather? Why were birds and fish so unprepared for it? Could it have something to do with the power of Satan to manipulate nature and destroy God's creation? What is behind the cold weather? Is the Holy Spirit being withdrawn from the earth so that extreme weather conditions have developed? By the way, fish are also dying in mass in New Zealand and Brazil and who knows where else. And there's an even more threatening development that's been going on for a number of years now.
In 2010, researchers who have been studying bumblebees have learned that there has been a shocking decline in more, by more than 95% of at least four major species of bumblebees and an up to 87% decrease in their overall geographic coverage. These findings were published in a U.S. publication called Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. You know what bumblebees do, don't you? They are vitally important pollinator. That study's author said that these bumblebee species are one of the most important pollinators of native plants. A three-year study determined that bumblebees are needed to pollinate various fruits and vegetables. Without bumblebees, entire segments of agriculture are threatened with extinction. Researchers and naturalists will probably say that this is normal, and they will downplay the significance of the decline of the bumblebees. But God's word tells us differently. They may try to say that it is because of pesticides and other pollutants that are weakening them and making them susceptible to environmental trauma. And this may be true to a certain extent. The uncomfortable fact is, then, that man is actually cooperating with supernatural agencies to destroy the food sources of the planet. Again, though it may sound simplistic, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy tell us that the Holy Spirit is being withdrawn from the earth because of man's wickedness. You may have heard about the problem of the honeybees dying off. It's called colony collapse disorder, and it started in 2006 in North America and Europe when whole colonies of bees just disappeared. Honeybees are absolutely essential to pollination of many fruits and vegetables, without which human populations would die off. Think about the implications of the loss of the honeybees and the bumblebees, the great pollinators and guardians of the planet's food sources. Jesus said there would be famines in the land at the end of time in Matthew 24. And do you think that perhaps in developed Western countries there is a process going on that could very well be life-threatening to whole societies? Honeybees are responsible for most of the pollination of the planet, and nearly a third of all food supply is directly dependent on the prolific pollination of the honeybee. Crops dependent on honeybees include almonds, apples, apricots, avocados, beets, blueberries, broccoli, cabbage, carrots and cashews and celery, cherries and coconuts, cotton, cucumber, grapes, lemons, limes, mangoes, onions, papayas, pears, soybeans, strawberries and watermelon. And that's just the beginning. And honeybees are important to your health. They produce the most nutritionally comprehensive superfoods in the world, and they are the only insects that produce foods for human consumption. These include bee pollen, honey, propolis, and royal jelly. These superfoods are directly linked to longevity, healing the body and overcoming disease, improving athletic performance, increasing cognitive abilities, and an overall enhancement in the quality of life in those who consume them. And that's not to mention the many useful products made from beeswax. Honeybees have a vital place in human survival. Without them, life on planet Earth would cease to exist. If we lose the pollinator bees, we will see very pricey food, and it would even become more difficult to get in rather short period of time, if not impossible. The earth is under siege. Everywhere it seems, nature is under stress in a thousand ways and a thousand forms. The Bible says, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Isaiah 56 51 verse 6. How does a garment wax old? Well, it gets frayed around the edges. It gets holes torn in it. It gets faded and no longer has a nice look. It might even shrink. You see, my friends, that's the way the world is going to go. It's already faded. It doesn't look as nice because the weight of accumulated sin has come upon it. 
But what is upsetting nature so much? Could there be changes taking place to the earth that would cause disorientation or confusion of birds and fish? Actually, there is. Tampa International Airport in Florida is renumbering the directional designators of its airport runways. The Federal Aviation Administration required the runway designation change to account for what the National Geographic News Report described as a gradual shift in the Earth's magnetic pole at nearly 40 miles a year, nearly 60 kilometers a year, toward Russia because of magnetic changes in the Earth's core. Have you ever heard of a magnetic North Pole shift? Well, it's happening. The geographic pole is not shifting, but the North Magnetic Pole is shifting by almost 40 miles a year, or 60 kilometers a year, toward Russia. And it's moving fast. It is accelerating, according to reports. I just wonder if this is creating or contributing to some of the havoc that we have seen in weather and seismic activity, not to mention confusion and death of wildlife. If airplanes can become confused by magnetic pole shift, don't you think birds and fish can also become confused? Is this the effect of the Holy Spirit being withdrawn from the earth? While scientists describe this phenomena as normal oscillations of the magnetic pole and suggest that this has happened many times in the eons of evolutionary history, this is mere speculation. Scientists don't want to think about God. But it seems that a magnetic shift could create problems for the planet, its wildlife, and its human inhabitants that could be severe. Of course, there's no way to know the effect of this until it happens. And while scientists are determined to explain it away as a natural event, they ignore that it is God who controls the core of the planet and the magnetic fields and all the other factors that are involved in life on Earth. Our world is in trouble and it may be starting to unravel more rapidly than it has in recorded history. Here is a very interesting statement from the Manuscript Releases, Volume 3, page 358. The men most learned in science cannot interpret or explain the ways and works of God. So scientists cannot tell us with accuracy what is really happening. They can only speculate. And they can give us some facts, but they cannot tell us what is going on behind the scenes. Their whole bias is to understand the physical and natural world all by itself. They cannot comprehend that supernatural forces protect the world from destruction. Here's a very pointed statement from the book Great Controversy, page 589. Listen carefully. Satan works through the elements also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. He has studied the secrets in the laboratories of nature, and he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. When he was suffered to afflict Job, how quickly flocks and herds, servants, houses, children were swept away, one trouble succeeding another as in a moment. It is God who shields his creatures and hedges them in from the power of the destroyer. But the Christian world have shown contempt for the law of Jehovah, and the Lord will do just what he has declared that he would. He will withdraw his blessings from the earth and remove his protecting care from those who are rebelling against his law and teaching and forcing others to do the same. Did you hear what this said? Satan uses his power to control the elements of nature to the extent that he is allowed. He can sweep away wildlife just as he did to Job's flocks and herds. Here's another important statement to consider. It's from Desire of Ages, page 306. Were those who serve God removed from the earth and his spirit withdrawn from among men, this world would be left to desolation and destruction, the fruit of Satan's dominion. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Satan is to be given increasingly more lethal power as the restraining power of the Holy Spirit departs from wicked men. Sin has brought decay, deformity, and death. Today the whole world is tainted, corrupted, stricken with a mortal disease. 
The earth groans under the continual transgression of the inhabitants thereof. There is no place upon earth where the track of the serpent is not seen and his venomous sting felt. The whole earth is defiled. The curse is increasing as transgression increases. The earth is preparing for purification by fire. That's from the Science of the Times, June 27, 1900. Oh, my friends, what a description. When men have greed, they organize themselves to consolidate their profits. They invent chemicals to get more yield from their farms. Or they modify the genes of plants, which changes the genetic and chemical composition of the food. But these chemicals and these modifications are dangerous and eventually undermine the whole interconnected ecosystem that gives life to the earth. First, the bees start dying off. Then the birds begin dying in mass. And then it's the fish. Millions of them belly up. These events all have their natural explanations. But researchers, naturalists, and scientists don't believe the Bible. They think that God does not exist. They think that the world exists on its own physical forces and was developed over millions and millions of years of gradual evolution. They believe that there is no God, no creator, no supernatural sustainer that holds it all together. They forget that there are moral reasons why these convulsions of nature are happening. Sin and transgression has gone so far that the Holy Spirit is gradually being withdrawn from the earth. These events are the natural result of the weight of sin. Here's another statement to understand carefully. It's from Great Controversy, page 614 and 615. Let us use a little sanctified reasoning to understand what this is suggesting. Those who honor the law of God have been accused of bringing judgments upon the world, and they will be regarded as the cause of the fearful convulsions of nature and the strife and bloodshed among men that are filling the earth with woe. Now let's meditate on this for a minute. During the final crisis, there will be staggering convulsions of nature. But the wicked will accuse the righteous of being the cause of it all. But for them to come to that conclusion, they will have to have experienced quite a bit of these fearful convulsions, wouldn't they? After all, they are conditioned to think that it's merely nature doing its thing. But eventually they'll realize that it is supernatural, and then blame God's Ten Commandment-keeping, Sabbath-keeping people. These convulsions of nature have to start somewhere, don't they? Perhaps they're already beginning, as the Holy Spirit is gradually being withdrawn from the earth. Do you think that perhaps we have come to the time when the elements of earth are starting to unravel? When you think about the incredible events that took place in the last year, do you see the hand of God warning the world that the end is near? When you see fires and floods, earthquakes, and other natural disasters, don't you sense that God is warning this sinful generation that our time is almost up? When you see the birds, bees, and fish dying off, don't you wonder how much longer we have until this world reaches its final crisis? Friends, I don't think it'll be very long. Like in the days of Noah, God sends messengers to warn his people. Sometimes it's an earthquake. Other times it's a mega storm. Sometimes it is another natural event. But ultimately, it will be chosen human vessels. But it is all with the purpose to awaken man to the danger of continuing in sin and living by his carnal heart. Jesus offers forgiveness to all who will turn from their sins and live for him. Your survival depends on it. The counsel of the Lord is clear to us about how to live in the last days. From Proverbs 3, 19 through 26, we read the following. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths are broken up, and the clouds drop down the dew. My son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul, and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. 
for the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep th thy foot from being taken. Do you want the Lord to be your confidence and keep your foot from being taken? I do. Then keep your eye on God's wisdom. Understand His ways. Let them not depart from your eyes. In other words, study God's Word every day. Open its sacred pages and you will find the answers to the perplexing questions of the world today. Follow His counsel and live by heaven's principles and you will not be afraid of the sudden fear. Neither will you be afraid of the desolation of the wicked. Think about it. There are some terrible things that are going to happen to this world. The wicked will be greatly stressed and distressed by the increasing difficulty of survival. They will moan, they will wail, and their hearts will fail them for fear of the things that are coming upon the earth. But the righteous man or woman doesn't have to be afraid. The Lord tells him that his bread and water shall be sure. His security is in Christ. It is not in the arm of human flesh. God will provide a way of escape from the arrow that flieth by day and the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Friends, the world is under siege. We are in the very last days. You can expect more surprises in the very near future. But friends, there is hope. Lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And may the Lord help you and bless you as you bring your life into harmony with His principles. May He give you victory over your sins, and by your faithfulness, in the midst of wickedness, may He open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so that you will not have room enough to receive it. That's Malachi 3, verse 10. Let us pray. Our wonderful Heavenly Father, thank You for Jesus who has done so much for the salvation of man. We are distressed at the transgression that is in the world, how wicked it has become. We sense that we are seeing the fraying of the natural world because it is waxing old like a garment. The close of human probation is almost near, and we are not what we should be. O oh, Father, help us, we pray. We need your Holy Spirit now more than ever. We need your grace and power to overcome our sins. Implant a love for Christ in our souls, and may the Holy Spirit teach us the way to live. As we look around us, we see the warning signs everywhere. We want to live today in the light of your presence. We ask that you will make us what you need us to be. We utterly depend on you. We are weak and failing, yet we sense that you can protect us from Satan's power. So we ask that you will do this. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
We hope you've been greatly blessed by this month's message. Your prayers and gifts mean much to us. Thank you for your support. The song you have just heard is called His Eye is on the Sparrow, sung by Jennifer Buttery. It is recorded on a CD with other beautiful hymns called Seekers of Your Heart. This beautiful CD is available from Keep the Faith Ministry. If you would like to have a copy of this CD or, or copies for your friends or family, just send $16 each postpaid to U.S. addresses to cover the cost, and we will gladly send them. Please mention Seekers of Your Heart CD. Our international listeners should send $20 USD. The following is our monthly prophetic intelligence briefing, a feature that brings you current events in light of Bible prophecy, especially for those who love the appearing of Jesus Christ. We can see the signs of the times telling us that we are nearing the world's great crisis. May the Lord find us faithful. Our first item this month is Africa's Rapid Urbanization Over a third of Africa's one billion inhabitants currently live in urban areas, wrote The Economist. But by 2030, that proportion will have risen to half. UN Habitat, a United Nations agency, reported that the population of some cities is set to swell by up to 85% in the next 15 years. Cairo, Lagos, Kinshasa will each have between 13 and 16 million people. Of the current populations of these cities, some 70% live in the slums. Food and water shortages are also predicted. The rapid urbanization is prophetic. The Bible shows us this in Genesis when Nimrod tried to establish a world government under a monarchy established in Babel. He built huge cities. His protégés also followed his example and built more cities like Nineveh, Sodom and Gomorrah and Gaza, etc. See Genesis chapter 10. These Babel builders determined to keep their community united in one body and to found a monarchy that should eventually embrace the whole earth. Thus their city would become the metropolis of a universal empire. Its glory would command the admiration and homage of the world and render the founders illustrious. The magnificent tower reaching to the heavens was intended to stand as a monument of the power and wisdom of its builders, perpetuating their fame to the latest generations. That's from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 118. Nimrod's attempt at globalization failed but it was not without consequences for the wicked descendants of Ham. Today, globalization is being attempted again. It, too, will fail. But like in the days of the generations after the flood, the urbanization into huge megacities will make the inhabitants of the world more vulnerable to massive problems such as disasters, strife, corruption, and greed, which will create shortages of basic necessities, crime, chaos, disease, and other unimaginable problems. Next, the U.S. economy, a fiscal train wreck. The U.S. economy is a fiscal train wreck waiting to happen that risks ushering in a period of stagnation featuring minimal growth, high unemployment, and deflationary pressure. U.S. economist Noriel Raubini wrote, said Reuters, Raubini was one of the first economists to predict the housing crash in the United States, said fiscal and monetary stimulus had prevented another depression. But, he said, that the future quantitative easing will have little effect on U.S. growth in 2011. He said the U.S. remains on an unsustainable fiscal course and that further quantitative easing that's creating billions more dollars and inserting them into the economy, will have little effect on the growth of 2011. The worst of the coming fiscal train wreck will be prevented by the Fed's easing. But the risk is that President Obama will then preside over a Japanese-style stagnation where growth is barely positive and deflationary pressures and high unemployment linger. There are not many even among educators and statesmen who comprehend the causes that underlie the present state of society. 
Those who hold the reins of government are unable to solve the problem of poverty, pauperism, and increasing crime. They are struggling in vain to place business operations on a more secure basis. That's Ministry of Healing, page 183. Next. Leaders keep silent as Germany controls European economy. On November 22, The Economist published an article on the Euro crisis that pointed out that Germany is firmly in control of the European economy. The markets these days listen only to Germany, says a senior European source, according to The Economist. The only way that that comment could be valid is if Germany has risen to the point where it is in control of the European economy, which also means it is in control of key policy-making organizations and even the politics of the European Union. On October 29th, as the Euro crisis involving Greece that erupted last spring was settle, starting to settle down, at the urging of Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany, leaders of the European Union agreed that they should reopen the treaties to establish a permanent crisis mechanism that would include the role of the private sector. Bondholders balked and dumped debt of the weakest countries, specifically Ireland and Portugal. But Germany keeps stumm, or silent, about the need to make speculators pay, said the economist. The European Commission, which was asked to draw up proposals for the mechanism, declines to speak of it. Herman van Rompuy, the president of the European Council, who is supposed to be consulting members on how to effect the necessary treaty chains, has taken a monastic vow island. Schell, a German magazine to have more details of anything done that the German finance men will on paper. According to German's plans, the Christians is pre preparing present fellow ministers in according to German plan, condition for ministers in early December. According to the Germans' plans, the conditions for all new bonds in the Eurozone would include a debt restructuring clause as of 2013. The goal of the clause is to let the debtors, or bondholders, decide how to restructure the debt of countries in crisis through a neutral negotiator. The problem, as Mrs. Merkel has discovered, is precisely how to manage the transition from blanket protection for bondholders to a system where they are exposed to greater risk and, in turn, impose greater discipline and impose it earlier on sovereign borrowers. Next year, new and more stringent rules demanded by Germany and the European Central Bank will be in place to prevent nations from overspending and getting into default territory. Now that they have been stirred, the markets are unlikely to be assuaged by yet more uncertainty and speculation. The best hope is to settle the matter as soon as possible. This time, though, leaders should deliberate knowing that, as one source puts it, the markets are sitting at the negotiating table. It's Germany with whom the markets will be negotiating. The storm could get worse before it gets better. Hold on to your hats, concluded the Economist article. It is also Germany that is the key player in resurrecting the Holy Roman Empire on behalf of the Vatican, as we have demonstrated in other research. See our sermon, The Clandestine Plot Against Greece, for instance. Don't forget that it was the Vatican, along with Ronald Reagan, the U.S. president, that orchestrated the collapse of Eastern European communism, which opened the way for Germany to reunite and rise to its dominant position of power in the EU, creating a European-wide political influence similar to the way it was in medieval Europe. The papacy and the nations of Europe are close to the restoration of a papal shadow government working through a friendly German government. Romanism in the Old World is preparing for its assault on God and His truth. Great Controversy, page 165. Next, confiscation of Vatican funds upheld. On December 20, 2010, a judge in Rome, Italy, has upheld the September seizure of 23 million euros in Vatican assets in a money laundering probe involving the Holy See's bank. Apparently, the secret workings of the Vatican Bank have triggered suspicion about the intended recipients of Vatican money. 
Prosecutors allege the Vatican Bank deliberately flouted laws cracking down on money laundering, and suspect clergy might have been frontmen for corrupt businessmen and mobsters. The Vatican says it's all a misunderstanding and contends it can clear up the matter. Geopolitical involvement implies secretive and often conspiratorial activity. The Vatican is no stranger to such things. It should be no surprise that bank regulators want to look more closely at the Vatican's financial activities. The Bible says that the Vatican is working with the merchants of the earth to accomplish its purposes. That would include shady organizations and underhanded power brokers as well. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and all the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Revelation 18, verse 3. Next, famine in Niger and Chad, West Africa. Starving people in drought-stricken West Africa are being forced to eat leaves and collect grain from anthills, say aid agencies, wrote the UK Guardian, warning that 10 million people face starvation across the region. Niger and Chad are experiencing desperate conditions and famine is everywhere. Soaring food prices have made food for millions unaffordable. Even livestock are dying. People are eating wild fruit and leaves and building anthills just to capture the tiny amount of grain that the ants collect inside, said Charles Bambara, an aid worker. Niger is considered to be the world's least developed country. Starving families there are eating flour mixed with wild leaves and boiled plants. 200,000 malnourished children need treatment. Seven million people face famine. And while there is food in the street markets, the people cannot buy it because of its price. Some are even slaughtering their livestock, which is often their only source of income. And thousands of animals have also died from starvation. Failed harvests due to drought are a large part of the problem and have brought untold suffering. Jesus prophesied that there would be famines as we near the end of time. Niger and Chad are certainly fulfilling this prophecy. Unfortunately, our time has run out. Be sure to go to our website and read more of our prophetic intelligence briefings. It has been a great pleasure to spend this time with you. I hope you have been encouraged to live for Jesus, for we are near the end. Remember that God has a plan for your life and that right now you can make a new start with Jesus. Thank you for your prayers and support, and until next time, May God bless and keep you and your family in His loving and protecting care. Keep the faith.